Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. The Financial Times chief economic columnist, Martin Wolf, has called Trump's trade wars with Europe and Canada, but obviously the big target is China. He's called this a, a war on the liberal world order. Well, what does this mean for China? China's strategy, the distinct road to socialism, which seems to take a course through uh, various forms of state hypercapitalism. What does this mean for China? The, the Chinese strategy was developed in what they thought would be a liberal world order. Now it may not be that at all. Now joining us to discuss what the trade war means for China and to have a broader conversation on just what is the Chinese model of cap state capitalism is Min Chi Li, who now joins us from Utah. Min Chi is, the professor, is a professor of economics at the University of Utah. He's the author of The Rise of China and the Demise of the Capitalist World Economy and the editor of Red China website. Thanks for joining us again, Min Chi. Thank you, Paul. So they, I don't think anyone, including the Chinese, was expecting President Trump to be President Trump. Uh, but once he was elected, it was pretty clear that Trump and Bannon and, and the, the various cabal around Trump, uh, the plan was twofold. One, regime change in Iran, which also has consequences for China, um, and trade war with China. Uh, it was declared that they were going to take on China and change in a fundamental way the uh, economic relationship with China and the United States, um, and, and aimed to a large extent at trying to deal with the rise of China uh, as an equal or becoming equal economy, and in perhaps someday in the not too distant future, uh, an equal global power, certainly as seen through the eyes of not just Trumpians in Washington, but much of the Washington political and economic elites. Um, so what, what does this mean for, for China's strategy now? Uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, is now a, the leader of the party, the leader of the government, put at a level virtually equal to Mao Zedong. Um, but his plan for development of the Chinese economy uh, did not, I don't think, factor in a, a serious trade war with the United States. OK, uh, as you said, uh, Trump was not expected and which meant that uh, Trump, in fact, was not the consensus candidate of the American capitalist class back to the 2016 election. Uh, so re with respect to this economic policy, especially about these trade protectionist measures, uh, these new tariffs imposed on the Chinese goods, uh, let's put it this way. These are not certainly not the traditional kind of new liberal economic policy as we know it. Uh, so uh, some sections of the American manufacturing sector capitalists may be happy about this, but I would say the majority of the American capitalists probably would not approve uh, this kind of trade war against China. Now on the Chinese part, and we know that China has been on this path towards capitalist development, and moreover it has been based on export-led economic growth model and with exportation of cheap labor. So on the Chinese part, ironically, China very much depends on this overall what Martin Wolf called liberal uh, global order, which might better be called uh, the model of global uh, new liberal capitalism. So China actually much more depends on that. And so if indeed there are tr serious trade conflicts between China and US, that will, of course, uh, undermine China's economic model. And so far, China has responded to this new threat uh, of trade war by promising that China, uh, despite whatever happened to the US, China would still be committed to the model of openness, uh, committed to privatization and the financial liberalization. Uh, the Chinese government has uh, declared new measures to open up a few economic sectors to foreign investment. Now, with respect to the trade war itself, uh, at the moment, uh, the U.S. has imposed uh, tariffs on 25% uh, tariffs on the worth of $34 billion of Chinese goods. And then Trump has threatened uh, to impose new tariffs on the additional $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. Uh, but this amount at the moment is still a small part of Chinese economy and about 0.3% uh, of the Chinese GDP. 
so the impact at the moment is limited, uh, but certainly has created lots of uncertainty for the global and the Chinese business community. So uh, given that this trade war could one get a lot bigger and a lot more serious and or even if they kind of patch it up for now, there's a lot of forces within the United States, both for economic and geopolitical reasons. Uh, economic being the, the discussion about China, you know, taking American intellectual property rights, uh, becoming the new tech sector hub of the world, uh, even mm -hmm. over uh, passing uh, the, the American tech sector, which then has geopolitical implications, especially when it comes to the military. If, the United St if China becomes more advanced in the United States and artificial intelligence as applied mm -hmm. to the military, that starts to, at least in American geopolitical eyes, uh, threaten American hegemony around the world. There's a lot of reasons building up, and, and it's certainly not new, uh, and it's not mm -hmm. just Trump for various ways the Americans want to restrain China. Does, does this start to make the Chinese think that they need to speed up the process of becoming more dependent on their own domestic market and less interested in exporting cheap labor? But for that to happen, Chinese wages have to go up a lot more significantly, which butts into the interest of the Chinese billionaire class. Uh. I think you are right. And so for China to reorient towards this kind of domestic consumption led model of economic development, the necessary condition is that you have this uh, income and wealth redistribution towards workers, towards poor people. And that is something that the Chinese capitalists will resist. And so uh, that is why, and so far China has not succeeded in transforming itself away from this export-led model based on exportation of cheap labor. The, uh, you know, there's, there's some sections of the left in various parts of the world that, that do th see the Chinese model as a more rational version of capitalism and do <laughs> see this because they've maintained uh, the control of the uh, Chinese Communist Party over the politics and, and, and over economic planning that mm -hmm. do see this idea that this is somehow leading China towards a kind of socialism, um, if nothing else, a more rational, planned kind of capitalism. Um, is, that, is there truth to this? Well, first of all, uh, China is not socialist at all today. And so in terms of the economic sector, uh, the state sector accounts for a very small, uh, not very small, but small fraction uh, of the overall economy by various uh, measurement. And then uh, regarding the rationality of China's development model, you might put it this way. The Chinese capitalists might be more rational than the American capitalists in the sense that they still use most of their profits for investment instead of just financial speculation. Right? So that might be rational from the capitalist perspective. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, regarding the exploitation of the workers and the Chinese workers still have to uh, work under sweat sweatshop conditions and regarding the damage to in environment, uh, the Chinese model is not rational at all. The, uh, my understanding of people that think this model works better at least than some of the other capitalist models is that there's need to go through this phase of Chinese workers, yes, working in sweatshop conditions and yes, wages relatively low, but overall the Chinese economy has grown by leaps and bounds and China's position in the world is, is more and more powerful. Um, and this creates the situation as more wealth accumulates, China's better position to address some of the critical issues facing China and the world. And, and then as bad as pollution is and such, China does appear to be um, out front in terms of developing green technology, solar, uh, sustainable technology. Okay, now uh, Chinese economy has indeed been growing rapidly. Uh, it used to grow like double digit growth rate uh, before 2010. But now China's growth rate has slowed down just under 7% in recent years according to the official statistics. And moreover, a significant part of China's growth these days derived from the real estate sector development. 
And so uh, there have been this discussion about uh, this growing housing market bubble. And it used to be that this housing price inflation was limited to a few uh, big cities. Uh, but for the first half of 2018, according to the latest data, the national average housing price has grown by 11% compared to the same period last year. And that translates into a pace of doubling in every six years. And so that has generated a lot of social resentment. And so uh, not only the working class these days are priced out of the housing market, uh, moreover, even the urban middle class uh, is increasingly priced out of the housing market. And so that is the major short run concern. And then in the long run, I think uh, the China's current model of accumulation will also face the challenge of growing social conflict, uh, worker protests, uh, as well as resources constraint and environmental damage. And regarding the uh, issue of uh, China's investment in renewable energy, it is true. Uh, China is the largest investor uh, in renewable energy development, in the solar panels, and although China is about the largest invest investor in about everything. And so uh, China is still the largest emitter of the greenhouse gases in the world, accounting for almost 30% of the total carbon dioxide emissions in the world every year. And then uh, China's own oil production in decline, but China's oil consumption is still rising. Uh, so as a result, China has become the world's largest oil importer. Uh, that could make the Chinese economy vulnerable to the next major oil price shock. And how seriously is, is climate change science taken in China? It, you know, if one uh, takes the science seriously, one sees the need for urgent transformation to green technology and urgent uh, reduction of carbon emission, not gradual, not incremental, but urgent. Uh, do the Chinese, uh, I mean, it's not, it's so not taken seriously in the United States that a climate denier can get elected president, but do, are, do the Chinese take this more seriously? Because you don't get the same, any sense of urgency about their policy either. Well, yeah, uh, so like many, other governments, the Chinese government also pay lip service to the obligation of climate stabilization. But uh, unfortunately, uh, with respect to policy, with respect to mainstream media, uh, it's not taken very ser seriously within China. And so although China's carbon dioxide emissions uh, actually stabilized somewhat over the past few years, but it started to grow again in 2017, and I expect it will continue to grow in the current year. I mean, I can understand why, for example, Russia is not, and not in any hurry to buy into climate change science. Its whole economy depends on oil. Uh, Canada also mostly pays lip service because of the Alberta tar sands is so important to the Canadian economy, shale oil is so important to the American economy as well as the American oil companies own oil under the ground all over the world. But China is not an oil country, you know, they're not dependent on oil uh -huh. income. You'd think uh -huh. it'd be in China's interest to be far more aggressive, and not only in terms of how good it looks to the world that China would be the real leader in, in uh, mitigating, reducing, eliminating uh, the use uh -huh. of carbon-based fuels, uh, but still they're not. I mean, they're not at the rate scientists say needs to be done. Uh, not at all. Uh, so although China does not depend on oil for income, but China depends on coal a lot. And coal is still something like 60% of China's overall energy consumption. And so it's still very important for where, China's where, Minchi, where does the coal mm -hmm. mostly come from? Don't they import a lot of that coal? Uh, mostly from China itself, uh, even though you know China is the world's largest coal in, uh, producer. On top of that, uh, China is either the uh, largest or the second largest coal importer in the world market as well. And then on top of that, China is also uh, consuming uh, increasing amount of oil and natural gas, especially natural, natural gas. And so although natural gas is not as polluting as coal, uh, it's still polluting. Uh, and so it's expected China will also become the world's largest uh, importer of natural gas by the year of 2019. So you are going to have China to be simultaneously 
the largest importer of oil, natural gas, and the coal. The uh, Chinese party, just to get back to the trade war issue uh, to, to, find, mm -hmm. to end up with, the idea of this Chinese nation standing up, Chinese sovereignty, uh, mm -hmm. Chinese nationalism, it's a powerful mm -hmm. theme within this new Chinese uh, discourse. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not saying Chinese nationalism is new, but it's got mm -hmm. a whole new burst of energy. Uh, mm -hmm. How does China, if necessary, to reach some kind of compromise with the United States on the trade war, um, how does China do that without looking like it's backing down to Trump? Uh, well, uh, yes, difficult task uh, for the Chinese party to balance. Uh, what have they have been right now is that on the one hand, they promise to the domestic audience they are not going to make concessions uh, towards the U.S., uh, while in fact they, they are probably making concessions. And then on the other hand, uh, to the outside world, and they make announcement that they will not change from the reform and openness policy, uh, which in practice means that they will not uh, change from the new liberal direction of China's development, and they will continue down the path towards financial liberalization. And so that is what they are uh, trying to balance right now. The, the, I said finally, but this is finally. Uh, mm -hmm. Do the Americans have a case? Does the Trump argument have a legitimate case that the Chinese, on the one hand, want a liberal world order in terms of trade and open markets and such, on the other hand, are not following intellectual property law, property rights mm -hmm. law, the way mm -hmm. other advanced capitalist countries supposedly do? Is, is there something to that case? Well, you know, let, let's say Chinese government right now, even though it's led by the so-called Communist Party, is actually much more committed to the new liberal global order than the Trump administration in the U.S. But I don't want to make justification for the uh, new liberal global order. Uh, but let's put it this way, the Trump administration or uh, this trade protectionist policy, although not justified, uh, it reflects fundamental social conflicts within the U.S. itself, and that probably cannot be sorted out by the Americans' current political system. So the, the crisis, you know, when you look at the American side and the Chinese mm -hmm. side, including uh -huh. the deep debt bomb people talk about in China, uh, th there really is no sorting out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. So the overall new liberal regime has become much more unstable. All right, thanks for joining us, Minchi. I hope we can pick this up again soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Mm -hmm.